Thank you very much. I'm Jocelyn Brown Saracino, and I'm a contractor working with the U.S. Department of Energy's Wind and Water Power Technologies Office. Um, and for the sake of time today, I'm going to be talking about some advances in the environmental research portfolio at the U.S. Department of Energy, but I'm going to focus on two stressor receptor interactions that we're doing research on rather than trying to cover the broad suite of our portfolio. So the Wind and Water Power Technologies Office works to both advance the techno technological readiness of wind and water power technologies um, and also works to enhance the deployment of those technologies in an environmentally sustainable way. So the majority of our budget does go towards supporting technology development, um, but we also have quite an extensive environmental research portfolio. And I'm going to focus today on talking about our environmental research portfolio for wave and tidal energy. Um, so over the course of the last couple of years, the environmental team at, within the Wind and Water Power Technologies Office has worked to develop a strategic plan for environmental research funding and then has worked to uh, develop an environmental research portfolio that fits within that plan. And that plan was developed based on an analysis of a number of variables, including looking across projects in the United States at what the regulatory requirements for monitoring were across projects, so what are the environmental questions that are driving monitoring requirements in the United States. Um, our perception of environmental risk, so both based on our, our approximation of what we think the likelihood of the impact may be and the severity of the event should it occur. Um, what we foresaw as the feasibility of actually reducing uncertainty here, given our budgets and given the, the size of the industry currently um, and the size of projects. And then finally, a gaps analysis in terms of what research has been done to date and what research do we think still needs to be done. Um, and the research that we do falls broadly into three categories. Um, research, both laboratory and field work and modeling to assess impacts. Um, work to advance the technolo technological readiness of monitoring technologies because we recognize that our ability to ask and answer these questions is only as good as the tools and techniques that we have to ask and answer them. Um, and then finally, analyses and meta-analyses and dissemination of research findings. And I think that really to come to a place where we've reduced uncertainty on these questions, it will require replication and it's going to require an understanding of both consistency and trends across projects and across research studies, but also an understanding of where we're seeing variation and what that variation is derived from. Um, so I'm going to focus today on kind of our conceptual framework for approaching um, understanding effects of operational noise and understanding both the likelihood and the effects of blade strike. And I'm going to give some highlights from our portfolio for both of those areas. But I'm, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to hit every project that we're doing within each of these areas. Um, but a number of them you've already heard about over the course of the last couple of days or you may have heard about in the past. And so I'm going to focus my time talking um, in greater depth about projects that are newer. Um, and you'll notice that in most of my slides, if, where there's a final report available, I'll have a, a link. Um, these slides will all go up on TFIS, so if you're curious to access those documents, those links will all be there and will be live. So I'm going to first start by talking about our approach to addressing research around uh, understanding what, what the effects of operational noise for these projects are likely to be. Kind of our first step in, in thinking about this is determining what potential levels of exposure are. And, and there are kind of two sides of that equation, figuring out whether species that are likely to be sensitive to sound are using project locations and, and how, um, and then determining what noise levels they're likely to be exposed to at those sites. And so we've done some work funding um, what we see as critical gaps in understanding where see sensitive species may be interacting with proposed sites. So for instance, we did some funding of um, looking at the presence and behavior of belugas in Cook Inlet in Alaska. And that project also looked, compared uh, a somewhat novel hydrophone um, day SARS and compared it with ears and sea pods. And that final report just was released recently and has some interesting results. Um, and then we've also worked to try to fill in some gaps in our understanding of what are the no what noises are these devices likely to generate. And so Brian Pelagi's team um, did a study of a seventh scale wave energy converter in Puget Sound. And then Sarah Hinkle and, and uh, fellow researchers at, at Oregon State University recently received an award for, from us 
to look at changes in noise levels during the installation and operation of a WEC on the, off the coast of Oregon. So the next step in, in our thinking here is, is given, presuming that there's exposure, determining whether behavioral or physiological effects are likely. Um, and I believe that Andrea Coffin presented on some of this research at the last EIMR, so I won't talk about this in, in too great of depth, but our Pacific Northwest National Lab has done some work for us, both looking at temporary and permanent threshold shifts and also tissue damage um, in a couple different species of fish. Um, and they were simulating the noise of being exposed to a turbine for a 24-hour period and didn't find significant impacts, but perhaps that's intuitive. This is operational noise from a single device. And so at this scale, what may be the, you know, the, the, more, the more pressing question is whether there are behavioral impacts. Um, and before I talk about this slide, I know that we saw a picture that looked very similar to this yesterday with a big X through it. Um, and I guess I would argue, I think that field testing is critical, and I'm going to talk about some field testing that we're supporting in a moment. But I do, I do think that there's some value in testing in controlled environments, and I think those two can complement each other nicely. Um, and so our Oak Ridge National Laboratory has been doing some research, some behavioral research, looking at tagged fish, um, exposing them to turbine noise, speakers playing turbine noise, and then um, looking to see whether attraction avoidance responses. And in their first trials, they saw no consistent uh, trends in attraction or avoidance. Um, and they are doing another set of trials this summer. So we've also done some work, or we've supported some work, um, characterizing sound and organismal response in situ. Um, and these, these projects that I'm going to talk about are both projects that Brian Palagi has worked on. So if you have more questions about these, feel free to talk to him. Um, the first was a project predicting the acoustic effects of the Admiralty Inlet Tidal Project in Puget Sound. Um, and that project did sound mapping, and it also used circuit noise from circuit um, sound sources to predict, and the response of organisms to that noise to predict what the likely impacts of the project would be. Um, we're, we provided a recent award to Brian Pelagi and the University of Washington, um, along with a team of researchers, to then measure what the marine mammal behavioral response to that project will be when it's deployed. Additionally, we're working to develop um, both noise propagation and noise generation models. Um, so our Sandia National Laboratory has been working with a modeling tool called CHAMP um, to develop a noise generation model, and they've done so so far for just a single uh, three-bladed axial flow turbine. Um, and they, they're predicting the noise generated from this device, and they've done some validation in the flume setting. Um, we're hoping in the future to have them work to make this modeling tool more flexible so you can predict the noise generated from a device based on its design and then embed those generation models in within propagation models that will allow developers and regulators to come together to predict how the noise from their device based on its design is likely to radiate at its site. Um, and one of our ideas is to integrate this into um, existing tools that we have for predicting changes to sediment dynamics and hydrodynamics. We have modules within EFDC to do that already. So in this slide, maybe you should have come at the beginning of, of thinking about how, how we come to understand the impacts of operational noise because and we're working to support the development of monitoring tools and we understand that tools are essential to our ability to ask and answer these questions and so we currently have an open solicitation to support the development of instrumentation, the development of processing tools, and also the development of integrated instrumentation packages to look at a suite of potential interactions between um, wave and tidal devices um, and organisms, not just noise, but including but not limited to noise. And finally, um, we're working hard to, to analyze, um, aggregate, analyze, and disseminate these results. Andrea and, and others have talked about Annex 4 in our TETHIS database. Um, and also, Andrea mentioned that one of the chapters of the final report of the first wave of the Annex 4 effort focused on the effects of um, marine and hydrokinetic or wave and tidal device acoustic outputs. So now I'm going to talk about our approach to addressing strike risk. And when Ben Wilson was talking yesterday, I was, I was 
pleasantly surprised by how similar some of the ways that we're thinking about asking and, and answering these questions were. And I think it's great that kind of, a, kind of maybe collectively our thinking is coalescing around some of these subjects. And I'm going to talk about plume studies, and I, I know that these plume studies are controversial. Um, I guess from my perspective, I think that it's really important. They're important tools for helping us understand before devices go in the water what their impacts are likely to be. Um, but we've funded some plume studies since the last EIMR conference that have looked at avoidance in plume settings in light and dark conditions. And what's interesting here is that you're seeing variation between species in avoidance levels, um, but not so much between day and night. But I know that um, some field work, especially Gail's field work, has not seen this trend. And so I think that this is an area that will need further research. Um, we're also working um, to help support the gathering of field data and um, the development of predictive models. Um, Gail spoke about uh, the Baki work, the excellent work that she's doing there to develop, to both collect data and then to um, use that data to inform a probability of encounter model. Um, and then Beth just mentioned uh, the ELAM modeling work that, that Gail and a suite of other researchers are also working on um, that uh, uses hydrodynamic cues as um, the predicting variable for changes in fish behavior around marine really hydrokinetic devices. And we'll, it, the data from Gale's research will be used to validate that model. Um, and then finally, our Oak Ridge National Laboratory is using data around the Verdant East River Project to both look at fish behavior and also to inform predictive models. So um, next I'm gonna talk about research around if an strike event occurs, what is the likely outcome? And we've done some plume work in this regard too, although it's not quite, you know, if a fish is struck, what is the likely outcome? Because not all of these fish in, in these studies were, were struck and probably very few of them were. Um, but the trends in the plume studies where, flume, uh, where fish were passed through um, a flume containing a turbine um, had relatively high survival rates. And, the, the other study here, and one, one of, round of this research has been done since the last conference, so that was looking at the free flow turbine. Um, and then also, Andrea and I think others have mentioned uh, the, the strike consequence analysis that they did looking at uh, southern resident whales. Here we're also so that, uh, supporting tools for monitoring, so the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory has created an animal alert system which combines passive and active monitoring tools um, for particularly for de uh, detecting southern resident killer whales. Um, Scientific Solutions Inc. has developed a, a detection, a tracking, an active sonar um, tracking system for tracking marine mammals and debris around tidal turbines. Uh, we heard about Brian's excellent work with the Ant Project yesterday, and then also the solicitation that we currently have open, we anticipate we'll, we'll get some applications for looking at collision, model, uh, collision monitoring rather as well. And then finally, this, this slide should look familiar. You know, in, in this regard too, we're also working to do meta-analyses and to disseminate the information. In the Annex 4 final report, also have a chapter on what we know to date about strike with turbine blades. So in closing, I mean, clearly more work needs to be done in each of these areas, but I, I do hope that we're making some progress on reducing uncertainty around environmental impacts of these technologies. And I just want to give a heartfelt thanks to all of the researchers who have conducted all of these studies. Um, I work with an incredibly dedicated group of researchers without whom this work really would not have been possible. Um, and my contact information is there. If you have questions about either these projects or kind of this, the rest of the suite of our portfolio, either for waiver title and, or for offshore work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You can take a question if anybody's asking. Yes, please. Not currently. Um, for in our offshore wind portfolio, we're both working, we have a baseline study of the mid-Atlantic that's looking at seabird distribution, and we're also developing an integrated monitoring package for bird collision with offshore wind turbines, but nothing in our um, wind type.